It's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Katja Rizlingbaldi, PhD, is Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk, and enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe. She is an associate professor and department chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University. Her research is focused on indigenous feminisms, California Indians, and decolonization. She is the author of the book, We Are Dancing For You, Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies. Dr. Baldy received her PhD in Native American Studies with a designated emphasis in feminist theory and research from the University of California, Davis. She co-founded the Native Women's Collective, a nonprofit organization that supports the continued revitalization of Native American arts and culture. Something I really appreciate about hearing Dr. Risling Baldy is her lively sense of humor and her ways of focusing on imagination and radical imagination about what is possible. So again, we're so happy and we're so honored that you're with us, Dr. Risling Baldy, and really looking forward to handing it over to you for your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here, even, even if it is in Zoom space, and, uh, and I know that that's not the same, and I always acknowledge that when I come into spaces, because I, um, I myself very much enjoy being able to meet people and see them in person, and, and also thinking about like um, how, how we still try to connect uh, so many multiple ways, even via Zoom. Uh, and then what we can do to like remind each other that um, that we're all sort of that this is not a normalized space, uh, and that I don't I don't want to start thinking about it as normal. I don't want to start thinking about it like this is just what we do now. Um, but instead, to think about like, well, this is uh, an adaptation that we're making during a period of time when we want to be able to maintain um, connection and action and relationship in whatever way is possible. And my my the people in my community, my elders have been reminding me that Native people have made these adaptations and have gone through these things before. And they they kept saying like we've done we've done pandemic before. Like we we know what this is like to maneuver through, and that's why our culture and ceremonies are so important to us because those are the things that we brought with us through those periods of time that helped us. And that's why we maintain it because it will, it always helps us in these periods of time when we don't quite feel like our feet are as grounded as they need to be. Um, so I, I'm, I'm from Hoopa, I'm from Northern California um, and I am the, currently the department chair of Native American studies at Humboldt State University. Um, I'm also the volunteer executive director of an organization called the Native Women's Collective. We are a nonprofit organization that focuses on the revitalization of Native American arts and cultures and the support of our community members to do the work that they want to do to connect uh, intergenerationally to culture and cultural backgrounds and arts and all the beautiful things that we have in our communities together. Um, we started that nonprofit like 11 years ago now, uh, around a kitchen table with me and several other uh, indigenous women. And one of my very close friends, um, Rachel Sundberg and I were sitting around this table and we were like, well, what do we want to see happen? Like, what do we wanna see come into being for us in this community? And we talked a lot about the work that we had been doing to connect with young people around cultural arts. And I was like, we need an organization and I want it to look like this and I want this to happen. And, uh, maybe someday we'll get some money and we were just sort of like we were like eating baked ziti and just like talking with each other and um, out of that came this collective and then we just had our 10-year anniversary last year and just talking about how it started just with us talking like just with us talking with each other um, and I will tell you that I do a lot of work around what what you know theoretically they start calling like radical imagination or um, like how we bring things into the world. And I think a lot about my grandmother who when I was growing up would say to me, she would be like, Kacha, um, 
Nothing can become until you speak it into being. It's why we were storytellers. It's why we had storytellers because you can't make anything happen until you start talking about it. Like you imagine it into being, that's how it knows that you, you need it. And so then it comes to you because you've been talking about it. And she was like, we imagine things all the time. We imagined what this world was supposed to be. We imagined how to live here. Um, we told those stories and then look as, as we become, like as we become that. So I always use the example with my students that like one day some guy was sitting around and he was like, I I'm gonna invent a, a website where people go on it and post pictures of their food. And then other people like, like those pictures of their food. And then I know people heard that story and they were like, that's crazy. Why would you do that? Like nobody wants to like people's food pictures. Um, and I, it always just starts with the conversation about what could be. And then what becomes is out of all of that, like imagination and discussion um, is the thing that it was meant to be. So I like to come into rooms and say things out loud. Um, imaginatory liberation, I think, is at the heart of what we try to do uh, in Native American studies. This idea that our whole lives we've grown up with certain stories. Um, those stories were really shaped by a curriculum taught in our schools that prevented us from having the imagination to think about what the next world could be. Uh, we talk a lot with our young people and we say like, you know, I've heard this great speaker where she was like, people have an easier time imagining what they're gonna do in a zombie apocalypse um, than they do imagining how to end capitalism or like what's after capitalism. And if you tell somebody, come on, let's, let's talk about when capitalism's over, they get really uncomfortable like that. They're like, what are you talking about? But if you say, hey, tell me what you're gonna do when a zombie apocalypse hits, everybody has a plan. Like they're like, I'm going to this place and I'm gonna do this. And it's because we've been taught to imagine a zombie apocalypse. We've, we have all kinds of TV shows and movies and everything giving us the imaginatory liberation to be able to say what, what it looks like. But we don't get to imagine beyond capitalism or settler colonialism or patriarchy. And we get taught instead that those things are normal and that the way that we live, that that's how it's supposed to be. And so our imagination is cut off from even having conversations. And I really enjoy coming into spaces and being like, here's some stuff that we could do. And then people always say, that would never happen. What are you talking about? Like they get, people's first thing is to get really like uncomfortable. And then I explain, like we, we haven't been given the tools to do this yet. This is why we do decolonization work. It's why we do Native American studies because we wanna imagine beyond this world. Um, and it's actually the Simpsons that taught me that. So you can get all kinds of lessons from like many places, but the Simpsons has actually taught me this lesson because I was watching this episode where, uh, and I always look for it, I'll find it someday, but every time I go looking for it, I get really lost in like all the Simpsons things, like how they predicted the future and stuff. So I haven't found the clip yet, but I will tell you that there's this episode where they're like in Game of Thrones and um, Lisa is a, like a wizard and uh, her dad is a peasant, right? Homer's a peasant. There's like a king there, there that's being really rude. And she goes to Homer in this episode and she's like, Homer, we have to go protest the king because he's bad and he's doing bad things to us. Let's go, we're gonna fight. We're gonna fight him, we're gonna protest the king. And Homer looks at her and goes, Lisa, feudalism is just the way that it is. And it's the way that it will always be. So why would we go protest the king and try to take apart this system? It will always be this way. There's nothing beyond feudalism. And I was like, that's it, right? Like when you're in the midst of it, you think this is the only thing that can be. And we get told settler colonialism, uh, capitalism, that's just the way it has, that's it. That's how life is. Not understanding that like, it's actually been a very short period of time that settler colonialism and capitalism has been it, the sort of how we structured this place that we currently call the United States or California or whatever. It's actually a blip in a historical moment that we've had to live this way. Um, because, and indigenous peoples represent 
a memory from before capitalism, and they also represent an imaginatory liberation beyond capitalism. And that is why they have been so scary uh, the whole time, because in, within their cultures and their ideas and their beliefs and their histories, they can tell you about what a society looks like before capitalism, and they can give you the imaginatory space to imagine a society without it. And that's why when they came, when they, when people came here, it was such a threat. It was such a threat to the entire culture and society because they were like, oh, you have an imagination beyond us. And we don't like that because they wanted to make what they were about to do normal, right? And natural. Um, and I always tell people like settler colonialism is a really important thing to learn about. It's the idea that when people come here, they decide they're gonna stay here. Colonialism is like people go to other places and they're instead trying to take a bunch of stuff and send it back to their motherland. Uh, settler colonialism is they're gonna come and they're gonna stay. And there's a couple of really key things they have to do to make sure that they stay here. But at the heart of all of that is the dispossession of land. They need land to make uh, natural and normal them being here. So they start to do whatever they can to get at the land. And a lot of that comes from uh, genocidal policies, uh, the violence against native peoples, because we are the rightful peoples of this place and they wanna be the ones. So they have to make sure that nobody either remembers us, understands us, or actually thinks that we're legitimate. And a lot of it comes down to land. Uh, there's a great book, if you haven't read it, it's called Indigenous Peoples History of the United States. It's by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And in it, she says everything, everything in history comes down to the land. Who, who works it, who owns it, who, who lives on it, who gets to do stuff with it. And when you're looking at what happened to indigenous peoples, it's all about land. So when I come into spaces, um, I tend to talk about land back or land return. And the reason is in my mind, it takes people to just start saying out loud what it would look like to return stolen lands to indigenous peoples to make it happen. Uh, we, have to we have to liberate our imagination of what it means to return. Um, and when I talk about land back, I also talk about fire back, water back, baskets back, like everything. And sometimes that can get really scary. I um, always have somebody after my talks when I would do them in real life, people would like wait in long lines to say stuff to me. And at the very end, there'd always be somebody that would like walk up and, and he would be like, so you like want my house? Like, is that what you want? Um, and I'm at the point now where I'm like, I'll take your house, you're gonna give it to me. Yeah, sure, it sounds good. Uh, but I was like, no, I, I want you to liberate your imagination. Like, it, like if you gave your land that you own back to indigenous peoples, how do you work with them to make the agreement of how you live there and what that looks like? Instead of involving the county government in that system, how do you go, I don't need the county government. I actually need the tribal peoples in that system. How do you empower them to be able to create that relationship? Um, but a lot of the times people will come up and be like, so you like want all the land? And I'm like, well, yeah, all of it. Like, that's, that's cool. Uh, and then they're like, I don't understand. I don't understand like why we, like why people would just give land back to you. And I always say, do you like own a lot of land somewhere? Like, is there, is there like a giant piece of land that you have that you're, and all the time they'll be like, no. And then I'll be like, how about like a house? And they're like, no, I'm like an apartment. And they're like, nah, -uh. I'm like in a storage unit. Do you own a storage? And they're like, nope. And I'm like, what are you worried about then? Like, it actually doesn't pertain to you. But at the same time, like a lot of the, our, a lot of the West Coast, a lot of the West side of the United States isn't owned by people. It's actually owned by the federal government and the state government. So we don't actually own the majority of the land in like California and Nevada and Oregon, right? So you have to kind of think about like, who does this really pertain to? Because land has been consolidated into ownership by governments and we're okay with that. We somehow think that's okay, but start talking about tribal peoples owning it instead and people get really uncomfortable. And what I have to talk to them about is that discomfort comes from that settler colonial ideology of it is scary for indigenous peoples to do that. And remind yourself that that actually comes from because they will help you to imagine beyond this system of oppression, heteropatriarchy, right? This idea of like how we, like this racialization, this white supremacy that builds them up. Suddenly you'll be able to see 
beyond that. Um, and I always tell people like settler colonialism makes like no sense whatsoever uh, if you think about it. Like if you really think about it, it makes no sense. Um, like patriarchy, this idea that like men should be in charge of everything, like say that out loud and then be like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Like men should just be in charge. Like, are you kidding me? Right. And I was like, even my own like husband and brother would be like, that's not a thing that should happen. And then yet we accept it as normalized that somehow men are supposed to be in charge. We see men mostly in charge of things and we don't go, that's weird. Uh, instead, we get taught to be like, that's normal. That's somehow normal. But we know it's not. Like deep down, we're like, that's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, I always say to people, look around. There are people in this world that don't have houses. That's not normal. That's not a normal way for a society to be put together where people have no place to live. I was like, settler colonialism won't even give you a house. It won't even give you food. We have people who can't get food. What is that about? That's not a normal thing. We should all be walking around like, that is not normal. Everybody should have food. Everybody should have a place to live. Everybody should be able to feel like they're healthy. That's actually a normal society. Instead, we get taught that there's something special about the fact that people can go to the doctor. And indigenous people's societies, everybody had a house. Everybody had food. Everybody had medical care. Everybody was taken care of. Uh, and, and yet you still see people going like, well, that's not possible right now. We could never do that. All the time I'll say, well, you know, prior to colonization, everybody had a house. And then my students will be like, that's just because you guys were so much smaller than we were. And also like you guys had way more space and less people to take care of. And so it would be impossible to do today. And one day somebody said that to me at a talk. I was like, everybody had a house. So I don't know why we don't all have a house today. And then he was like, that's not possible because of you know, the way the economy works. And I said, oh, so you're like an expert in housing in the United States. Like you've looked at every HUD report that's ever been written. You've looked at the number of homes available versus like the way in which we spend money. And you've looked at who actually owns real estate and property and what we have open versus what it would cost to actually let people live in there, even if it was at a subsidized rental level, which the government primarily paid for. And after all that research determined, we could not possibly give everyone in the United States a place to live. And he was like, well, no, I've never done that. And I was like, well, why are you talking to me? Because in my mind, all you're saying is something that you think is true because you've been taught only to imagine to this point that somehow scarcity is necessary for a society to run. Like these are all things that when you grow up in an indigenous culture and you start hearing these stories, what you really hear is like, it's possible to have a society where everyone has a place to live and feels good about themselves and they can eat and they can drink the water. We can't even drink our water. We can't even go swimming in the river. Like I swear, if we brought an Indian person from like the year one and we were like, look at, all, look at this great big river. And they would look at what we did to the river in Los Angeles and be like, what is wrong with you? Like what is wrong with you? And they wouldn't think of us as this really advanced technological society of awesomeness just because we can like have our food delivered or tweet about what we're thinking, right? At the minute that we think it, they wouldn't be like, that's that's great. They would be like, what is wrong with you? Look what you did. Like, and so to think about how they, how they help you to imagine something that isn't just what we see and get told, like this is the only way that it can be. Um, and that's what I like to do. I like to come in and be like, ooh, guess what we could do today? Give all the land back. I will tell you that like a lot of people will be like, I can't do that today, right? Um, I've been like actually floating. I've been like, like really thinking about becoming a notary because I, I would like one day I'm gonna go into a space and be like, give all your land back. And then someone's gonna be like, hey, I can give, I'll give all my land back and then I'll be a notary. So I can be like, okay, let's fill this out right now. Um, but I will say like, I just like coming in and saying it, I call it inception. Uh, I say like this big thing where I'm like, I'll go to the museum and they'll be like, can you talk to us about NAGPRA and return and what that looks like in Californian communities? And I'll come in and be like, you guys should give all these baskets back. Like, I don't know why they're here. Um, and I'll just say it. And then like, it'll get in their little brains. And then five years later, they'll be like, I don't know why, but I really want to give these baskets back. Um, and then I'll be like, yes, that's a fantastic idea. 
I think you should definitely do that. It is brand new information. Congratulations. Good job. So I never expect things to like hit right away, but I will tell you, um, I like to say the things out loud that are possible. And I'm gonna use the example today because I'm gonna show you a couple of short videos and things of, of land return in my own area uh, and what happened in our region, specifically around land return. So um, where I wanna start is here. I wanna give you all some really clear information about land in the United States. This is how I arm people with information, especially if they're like, ooh, I do know the person that I should approach about the potentiality of land return, right? Uh, but they don't quite know how to talk about it. Um, I think one place where I like to start is I need to give you information about how, how disparate land ownership is in the United States. And the idea that who is left out truly of land ownership in the United States are people of color and indigenous peoples at the heart of that. So it's really disheartening to think about the fact that we are supposed to have millions upon millions of acres based on the treaties and all these ideas and then the fact that the treaties were broken, what we have is so small compared to that. And then you look at the disparateness between land ownership and wealth and what happens in indigenous communities. And you have to ask yourself like, why, why are we okay with indigenous peoples continuing to live in uh, extreme poverty, continuing to have some of the lowest educational rates knowing what happened and then also knowing that all their land was illegally taken and then also knowing that much of the land that we have today is because of illegal seizures of indigenous land. How are we okay with that? We actually shouldn't be okay with that. We should be like, why are we keeping these people in poverty and then watching as other people are building good, really great land-based things and we're okay with that. Um, and I always say to people when they get scared, so I'll say, uh-oh, now you're thinking, you're like, I've, I, I own this many acres. Like, what does that mean for me? Is she coming for, that's when you're going to ask me if I want your house. Um, you're going to be like, Is, are you trying to take my house for me? Uh, and I, I, like I said, I will take your house, but I want you to kind of think about like what this means for you. Because when I show you, like I always say to people, when you learn these statistics and then you start thinking about your own uh, intergenerational wealth, land ownership, like what that looks like. Um, understand that if you walk away from this talk and you go, I get it, but I can't do it because it's too scary, then what you're actually saying is, I get it, I can't do it, I'm okay with Indian people continuing to live this way. That's what you're saying, because that's what's going to happen. And we have real things at stake when it comes to how we understand our relationship to land. Um, in Hoopa, for example, there was a piece of land for sale that we could not afford to buy that was connected to our reservation that was on the docket to be sold to a white supremacist nationalist group that was trying to build a compound right next to our reservation. Uh, and we couldn't afford to buy that, right? And there's no incentive, which there should be, some kind of incentive for you to sell land back to tribes, especially land that is connected to their reservation properties, there is not. So there's like a lot we can do structurally to think about what that means um, because we had no recourse for that. And instead of the landowner being like, oh, I should give this land back and that would mean this and this. It was like, that's who's offering the most amount of money for this space. So you see how like we have real things at stake when it comes to this. Um, so I'm gonna share this. Oh, I can't share because it said host test. Per like, I have to become a co-host, I think, to share my screen. I think you're ready to share there, Dr. Risling, probably. Oh, okay. So a couple of quick things just to go through. Um, so the first is some things to understand, like some things to clearly understand is that nationally white families are significantly wealthier than all other racial or ethnic groups combined. It is by, like if you're looking by race, what you see is that white families have much more wealth uh, cumulatively than basically every other group of people in the United States. So that is something very clear to understand. Um, second is of all the philanthropy funding that goes through the United States foundations, only 0.4% of it is directed to native communities. So there's actually a history of not a lot of giving from philanthropic foundations who, by the way, a lot of them make large amounts of their endowment funding off of land-based earnings, right? And natural resources. So they have all this money coming through and then very little of it is actually being directed toward native communities. 
Uh, the five largest landowners in America are all white and they own more rural land than all of black America combined. So you have five people who are all white owning more rural land than all of black America combined. I think that that's pretty telling about when you're looking at like who owns land in the United States. Um, one of the largest agricultural landowners now that just came out uh, was published this year is Bill Gates. Bill Gates has been for some reason purchasing a lot of agricultural land um, and is now one of the largest agricultural landholders in the United States of America. I was like, now he said, give it all back. Um, white Americans by comparison own more than 98% of US land amounting to 856 million acres with a total worth of over $1 trillion. There is a lot of wealth in land. Um, there's a lot of ability when you own land, right? And much of that land, especially in California is passed down like large areas are passed down through families who primarily got it during the gold rush, uh, during coming in and seizing of land. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that today. But if you look at this, you're saying 98% of, this is 98% of US land that's owned by private landowners. So it's like 60% of land is owned by private landowners. 98% of that are, is, is, are white landowners. And that's, I think, really important to understand. Um, so if you look at the federal public lands in the United States, what's really interesting is that you can see that while when we're talking about who owns land, uh, we're saying um, here. So if you're talking about who owns land, what you're saying is, is that primarily private landowners own land in the United States. The federal government is the second largest landowner in the United States of America, followed by state governments, then you have tribal authorities, and then county and local government. So private landowners own a majority of the land. But if you look at the map of the United States, it is not private land ownership that owns a majority of the land on the west coast, like the west side of the US. Um, and so what you're seeing is that federal public land surfaces really are what cover a lot of the states in this region uh, over here. And I think that that's also important to note, so like when we're talking about private land ownership in California, I think uh, it's still a majority that's not in federal or state hands. I think it's like 45, I'll have a map here. Um, so it tells you, but at the same time, it's a lot of like federal land ownership that we're talking about. So in California, 45.3% of the state is owned by the federal government. Um, like of the total land area. You see Nevada is like 84%, right? Oregon is 53%. So you can see again on the West Coast where you see land ownership is kind of broken up a little bit differently, even though 60% of the land in the United States is owned by private landowners. Now, if you look at agricultural land owners through acres owned, the value of land and buildings by race and ethnicity, uh, in the United States, you have white uh, land on, agricultural land owners being for the 96% of all private land agricultural owners, right? Um, followed by Black Americans at 2%, and then you have American Indians as, at 0.7%. So I think it's like really important to think about this in terms of who owns the land that we work, that we tend to, that we interact with, that feeds us. And then what does it mean that it is primarily owned by white Americans with such a disparity. Like, what does it mean that like, it's really difficult for indigenous peoples, black peoples, right? Like to get into what, what it would be to be like, to, to work the land like through agriculture and through industry. Now land grabs in the United States are not something new. And it's important to think about the fact that like much of how the United States came together was through land grabs. So when we think about policy, we sometimes will think about it as like, oh, it was just trying to like round up native people, take them away. But what it really all came down to was the land, like they were trying to get at the land, whether that be through genocide, through removal, <clears throat> through allotment, like pick a policy of the federal government and we can tell you how that was actually a land grab, how it was actually a way of trying to get land away from indigenous peoples. So in the United States, you have policies like removal, that's, you've probably heard of the Trail of Tears, and that's removing people from the South and moving them into Oklahoma, into Indian territory. Um, but really it was a land grab. They would come in and take over their farms, take over their region, and you, then suddenly these tribes lose all of the land in the region because people just move in as they're being moved out. Uh, the Oklahoma land rush then happens after that in the late 1800s. And what you see is Indian territory is broken down again because people are allowed to rush and claim land. Uh, in California, they had a number of removal policies you get land removal from Indian people during the mission system. 
where they take over large areas of land, they remove Indian people from those lands, force them into the mission system, and then they turn those lands into agricultural lands. I think that that's really important to consider. Uh, they're making a lot of this into agriculture, into industry. So suddenly you have large wine farms popping up uh, and, and then Indian people are being forced to work in the fields for these industries. Um, and then you have the treaties in Cal, oh, the Round Valley Indian Reservation was created um, trying to remove Indian people from uh, Northern and Central California onto a singular reservation. That would have been the Round Valley Indian Reservation. Uh, many of our peoples from Humboldt were removed under that. So sometimes people in Southern Humboldt will say things like, there's no more Indian people here. That's not true. There's lots of Indian people there. But also a lot of them were removed and sent to Round Valley. So there's no tribal nation currently like working within that territory but you have a lot of tribal representatives in Round Valley where they were moved to. Uh, in California, we had 18 treaties that we signed that would guarantee us lands, but all of those were subsequently unratified and then put under an injunction of secrecy by Congress so that we wouldn't be able to get at them. Um, and what they basically said was that we were guaranteed certain lands in California, and then they decided they weren't going to ratify them because during the gold rush, people were very upset by the amount of land that was going to be guaranteed to indigenous peoples. So again, they were trying to get at more land. Allotment was a policy that people said was supposed to turn native people into farmers. They were given, they were taking their, they were taking their indigenous reservation lands and breaking it into smaller tracts of private land ownership. They wanted to make all Indian people private land owners and would give them certain amounts of land that they would have to work for agriculture. It actually was also a land grab because once they got done handing out those lands, they were like, oh, look at all this surplus land and they would give those away to people. It also was a really dangerous time for native people because the rule for Indian women was that while they could get an allotment once they got married, that allotment went directly to their husband. You saw a lot of forced marriages. You saw a lot of women getting married and going missing. You saw like an increase of women being kidnapped and being forced to be married to someone to try to get at their land. So it was another land grab. Um, the national parks and state parks were created as a land grab against indigenous peoples. What they say to notice about the national and state parks is that they were created in areas where people were like, this area is so beautiful and wonderful and has been maintained this whole time just naturally by the wilderness. Um, so we're going to take it. And those, those tended to be indigenous lands because that's who was primarily caring for the region. And so they're coming into indigenous lands and seizing them under the name of national and state parks. In the case of Yosemite, for instance, the, the Indians were still in there. The native peoples of the region were still living there when they made Yosemite and came in and they were like, this is wilderness now. So you have to get out. And they were like, this is not wilderness. This is our home. This is where we live. It's where we've always lived. And so they were kicking native people out of national and state parks to get at their land. It was another massive land grab. And then you have the land grant universities of the United States also another massive land grab of indigenous lands because you would notice that they didn't go in for the national and state parks or the land grant universities and go like, oh sure, we'll take Los Angeles um, and we'll make that into a national park, right? They would never take land where there were lots of settlers living but we're in the places where there were native peoples living and still managing those areas, they took that land. They did the same thing for universities. So to think about that in terms of all of these are massive grabs of land against indigenous peoples. This is a map example of the Trail of Tears, uh, but like the multiple trails of tears that happened for removal in the region. So you can see that it happened multiple times to multiple different tribal peoples at different times during, um, like you've got all these different peoples that are moving into Oklahoma, like Indian territory. And so you talk about them as not just removals, like they're, they are removals, they're very sad. There was a lot of stuff like death that happened on these trails but it was also a land grab because people moved in and took that land and made it into their own. And so there's, lot, there's farmers and people that can trace their uh, heritage back to this is what, we got this land because we stole it from Cherokee people after they were kicked out. In California, these are the lands that would have been guaranteed to the California native people uh, had their treaties been ratified. So you're looking at them picking 18 treaties throughout the region. So this shows you like where all 18 treaties had been uh, put into like what would have created large massive areas for California Indian people over here, sort of like a black and white version of it. These are lands that would have been guaranteed to California Indian people, millions of acres had they been ratified. They were not ratified, again, because of people saying they didn't want Indian people to get that much land. As a result of them not be, being ratified, many native people had already started to sort of move into areas where they were like, oh, we agreed to this treaty. Um, and then they, they were told that they abandoned 
their initial, so they're like, you abandoned your tribal lands, which meant we could take them. And they were like, no, we made this agreement. So now we're going to our new, and they were like, no, those don't exist either. And so suddenly you get native people who have no lands because they moved under the guise of the treaties, which they weren't told, weren't passed. And then suddenly people are like, you left. So now these are ours. So to think about that, it was like a huge land loss and land grab. Uh, this is a map of the land grant university. So you're looking at like where indigenous lands totaling around 10 million acres were given to 52 land grant universities uh, in the region. And I think that it's like really helpful to see like the amount um, of land, right? Under the Morrill Act that was sort of seized from California Indian people and in the regions that, that they were seized to kind of think about how they're trying to shape the state of California at this time. Uh, and then how people would have thought of it as like a good thing. They would have been like, but this is good because we're building universities we're building research instead of thinking, oh, this is as a result of stealing massive amounts of lands from tribes, especially tribes that at the time uh, had been really dealing with um, what had happened through removal and genocide and things like that. So how are they supposed to like bind together and come and be like, don't take our lands for universities when they're just coming post genocide. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit, we're going to watch a video now about California. And I want to kind of, it gives you a little bit of history about California and California Indian people. And it tells you about like the genocide in our region. And I want you to think about it as like potential new information that you're getting, um, information that you maybe heard before, but like really sticks with you. Uh, this video was made as an opportunity for like our incoming students at Humboldt to learn more about the work that we do in the region, especially around place-based learning. Um, but also to really ground them in like how you understand this history to then understand why we do the work that we do. Um, so some things to know about California, there's close to 1 million people living in California prior to uh, colonization contact or what Jack Norton calls invasion. Uh, it's the largest population north of Mexico. In 1769, they're able to count 310,000 native people living in California. This is the generally agreed upon number that people use a lot. If you read history textbooks, they'll tend to say there were 310,000 native people living in California. We as Californian scholars know that it's closer to 1 million that were living there. But regardless, by 1900, there was less than 20,000. Uh, so it's something to think about in terms of this period of time between 1769 and 1900 that results in a 90% reduction of um, the population. So I am going to pull up the video for everyone and uh, we're going to watch it. It's about a 12 minute long video and then post the video. I'll give you some additional information and then uh, we'll hopefully have some time after that for questions. Um, so let me share. For California Indian history specifically, I think it's important for people to know that California has always been a populous place. It's home right now to 109 to 111 tribes, but back then you're talking about tribes everywhere. no empty space of wilderness that exists in this place that we currently call California. The way you know that there were California Indians everywhere is that every place had a name. There was not a mountain or a field or a region that there wasn't a tribe who had already named it. For the sciences, I think that the land bridge theory has always been sort of a first point of knowledge about Native people. But there have been new studies that have shown that there was humans in this side of the Americas over 100,000 years ago, which would mean that that is around the same amount of time in which they say people were sort of first leaving Africa. And so we are asking people to complicate how they understand who we are as Indigenous peoples here. What we say is we're from this place. And that's a real and true belief that we have. We are a part of the land and the land is us and we didn't migrate from some other place. We've always been there. We've always been a part of our land 
and not above it, not below it, but equal to, and we have our role. Our roles come from that engagement and come from seeing what needs to be done to make things the best way that they can be. So all of this is very important for people to understand because I think sometimes they think Californian people are here, but they're not really doing much with the space. There's so much evidence of like agriculture. There's evidence of large areas in which they're tending to. There's evidence of ways in which they're shaping what we now think of the natural landscape. And then colonization happens. Most California scholars, they call it invasion. So we're being invaded. When Cabrillo was first on one of his ships in 1500s, burning of the land is what actually gave away um, people on that land. That was like the first thing that, you know, colonizers saw was our traditional burnings of the lands. You're talking about three waves of destruction. From the start of these waves, there's not really a time period in which California Indians can recover from what's happening to them. So the first wave of destruction is the Spanish mission system. They build the first mission in San Diego. There's 21 missions that they build in total. This is Father Junipero Serra and they're bringing people into the missions in the hopes that they can create this labor force to be able to establish this extension of Spain. The mission system is effectively an enslavement system of California Indian people. The missionaries bring along with them Spanish soldiers. The soldiers are written about in these records as being perpetrators of sexual violence, not only against women, but also children. Junipero Serra actually talks about that in his journals. He's like, they are sexually assaulting women and children in front of people. And when people try to stop them, they get shot. I mean, it's a very violent type of situation. The, the mission system sort of stops around San Francisco. And so up here in Northern California, what they say about us is we were contacted relatively late in the sort of colonization cycle. We had had contact with some explorers who had come through, people that were looking mostly for gold. And at a point, they find gold. And this is where you get these sort of like massive influx of the gold rush. And it just came like overnight. And it came in hard. And life just changed drastically and just immediately in, in a lot of ways for California people. They're not here so that they can set up a colony or so that they can establish a labor force. They want gold. They will kill whoever is in the way. They will take apart whatever needs to be taken apart. They'll do whatever it takes. The thing about the gold rush that people don't think about is that it was actually an environmental destruction as well. And then on top of that, they are setting up a political system and a state system of laws and governance that will legalize the genocide that they want to commit against California Indian people. Our first Lieutenant Governor, Peter Burnett, saw this huge population of Indians in the state. And so he's the one that, you know, charged the war of extermination on the California Indians. And we lost, you know, probably around 80% of our total population in just a, a short period of years. The early settlers wanted the resources. They wanted what would make them rich faster. But instead of asking the tribe to help them or assist them, they said, well, since the tribe probably won't just give it to us, we're just going to wipe them out, we're going to massacre them, we're going to take everything for ourselves. Each region of California is allowed to set their own sort of, what are we going to pay for a scalp or a head? But when you look at advertisements, what you see is that they're advertising them at things like $5 a head and 25 cents per scalp. The first year that they do this, they pay $1 million. The state of California says that it has paid $1 million for killing Indian people. The second year they do it, it's $1 million.
in this region, every single tribe in this region would have some kind of stories about the violence that came out of the gold rush. My great grandfather, you know, his, his family is from Kadu country. His great uncle had, his mom had lived through the gold rush and he was born sort of like at the tail end of this period of time. And he would always say to my mother, you know, remember granddaughter, um, you're here because some minor was a bad shot. Like that's how close it is to who we are. When modern contact, we had to forget about all our relations. We had to forget about all the sciences. We had to forget about all the philosophies. We had to forget about everything that was ingrained for us for thousands of years to a shattered existence. take your kids from your family and take them to boarding schools. And then similarly, you, you were not to practice your cultures, you're not to practice your traditions, you're supposed to practice, you know, I hate to say it this way, the white man's religion. You, you, we're gonna Christianize you, you're gonna follow our God. I know that I'm a product of forced assimilation. I know I was stripped of some of the smartest information a human being could have. And I know I don't have that now. But I know it's attainable over time. And we're on the right path. There's all these great moments of Native people making sure that they were trying to hold on to things, like fighting back and making plans for the future. It's palpable in Humboldt County. The Native American community, and especially the Wiyats and the surrounding tribes, were put through a lot. It wasn't just the Wiyats, it was Hurok, Hoopa, you know, we were all put through a lot during the early years. Here we are, we're growing, we're becoming a stronger nation. We're working together with each other to create a positive thing. And not only us working with each other's sister tribes, we're working with the cities, the governments that surround us, the schools, HSU, to make this more positive. Humboldt State University is within the Aboriginal territory of the Wiat people. And then we have several other large tribes around here, the three largest in California, the Karuk, the Yurok, and the Hupa. So being that we are in the backyard of three of the largest tribes, we can draw off and partner with some of our local tribes to bring that extra educational component to our STEM and natural resource students. Here at the Indian Natural Resource Science and Engineering Program and Diversity in STEM, we go by Intercept Plus. Our services generally provide navigational suggestions to students, assisting them navigate the College of Natural Resources and Sciences. We often are enriching that experience with extracurricular activities coming from an indigenous perspective. So bringing up our ancestors' practices and techniques of managing landscapes, melding them or braiding them in with the scientific method and innovative technologies. In Native Studies, we're doing a sort of broad spectrum of what it's like to learn from indigenous peoples and cultures and knowledges so that we can build a better world, build a better way of knowing. It's about how we learn with and from native people instead of disciplines historically that have focused on the study of Native American people. My paternal grandmother was one of the founders of the Indian Tribal Education Personnel Program. I tip uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s. Her and a bunch of other mothers and grandmothers, they were the ones that kind of started a lot of our other community programs, our healthcare programs, our education programs. 
I always think it's a pretty amazing story because a lot of those women, her included, um, had attended boarding schools. And for those women to come back from that and, and still understand that we needed health and we needed education and we needed a strong community. When you talk about the Indian Tribal Educational Personnel Program and United Indian Health Services having these women with MOXIE, they come from a generation of women who have been having to just hold that strength for such a long time. And part of the work as tribal people is how do we go back and tap into that, because that's always there. We come from a long line of those folks who are moving forward and have had to keep their dignity, keep their pride. And although it hurts, we're still doing that work. That's what I try to tap in for the young people, tribal people in particular, but also for non-Indian students to hear that too. That it's not all historical trauma and then we're gone. No, it's historical trauma. We're still here and we're not going anywhere. We're still learning, we're still enduring. So I, I wanted I wanted to come back um, to a couple things from the video for you all that will kind of help to round out what we're talking about today. Um, one second. This is actually a map of what would it, or what are our current federally recognized California Indian tribes in California. Um, and you see sort of like a difference between the number of acres that would have been guaranteed under the treaties and then what it looks like today in terms of tribal lands. But to also notice that there are tribal lands throughout the state of California. Uh, whether or not there are tribes located in the region where you are currently at and um, in terms of federally recognized tribes, state recognized tribes or unrecognized tribes, uh, and you have a list of them and you're like, well, I, I actually don't know if there's any people. There's definitely people there. There is definitely a people tied to that region. There's definitely a people that could, could use being reconnected to those regions. So there is no region that I, anybody could come to me and be like, well, I just don't think there's anybody that I could approach about this land. No, there is. There's always somebody. Um, and if not, I always say our organizations, uh, we could also use the donations of land and land return because we use them to reconnect people from several different tribal nations to spaces. Um, but to think about the difference between what would have been guaranteed, what are our what are our ancestral territory, which is all of it, and then what is look what it looks like now. And this does not include unrecognized tribes, of which we have a number in California, specifically because of all these policies I told you about. They really went after California Indian tribes. They terminated a the number of them. They wouldn't sign the treaties. Like they did all the things that they could so that, and even with all of that. We still have over 110 federally recognized tribes in California. So we should have so many more uh, and we don't. And so to think about that, like when you're reconnecting land, if you're in uh, like say the Bay Area or Central California, you're reconnecting land to people who have been denied even being recognized as Indians by the federal government. Um, so to be able to say, I recognize you and I want you to have this connection, that's very important, especially for our unrecognized tribes. Now, some of the things that went over very quickly in the video, 90% of the population is reduced. They're looking at the Spanish missions, the end of the missions and the gold rush. When we look at our region and we talk about the enslavement of California Indian people, I think what's really important to recognize is that yes, enslavement of California Indian people was legalized under the California um, Act for the Government and Protection of Indians and allowed them to take Indian people into apprenticeship. And when you look at the slave records of California Indians during this time, so while California enters the union as a no slave state, they actually legalize the enslavement of California Indian people. So that's how they're able to uphold their economic system, right? Um, but when you look at the slave records, you might think like they were kidnapping people, like a full grown adults in slavery so they could have labor. But in fact, they were mostly kidnapping children. They were mostly taking Indian children into slavery. Uh, if you look at the records for Humboldt County, a majority are between the ages of seven to 12. Children tended to get the most paid for them. And the majority of those are girls. So actually girls get the highest amount paid for them. They are mostly taking Indian girls ages seven to 12 and selling them into slavery. So when you think about what the slavery system looked like in California, 
Uh, I like to say we have to call it what it is. It's a sex slave industry. That's what it actually is. It's not any, it, that's what they're doing. They are trading children. They're trafficking children and they're sending them to places where nobody will protect them. And then you sort of see records of people. You can actually see the names of the people who were the people that primarily kidnapped children and sold them into slavery. And you see, you can trace those back to some of the landowners of Humboldt County because they were able to take that money and then buy land. So you're looking at how this system sets up, how we're able to like, we, we have all of our children being taken, we then start losing our land to all these spaces. So to think about that too, like what that means that people made uh, money off of the enslavement of Indian children. This is my great grandfather who I talk about in the video. I like to show a picture of him since I mentioned him. Uh, my great grandfather Swarm David Risling Sr. Um, born at the tail end of the gold rush. <clears throat> what was interesting to note about him is that I actually knew him when I was young uh, so that's like how close this is like you have him being born at the very tail end of what was the gold rush post like his mother and uncles being like shot at and their villages being set on fire. He's he's growing up with them. And then I know him as I'm a very little person. So you kind of see how connected we are to that period of time. He did a lot of writing that I really appreciate that he left behind. He wrote a lot about what he knew about the gold rush because he was saying how there's no records, there's no archives, there's nothing, like they didn't keep it right. And so we have the stories. So he did write a lot. And this is actually from something he wrote where he was talking about his own people, the Karuk. And he said the Karuks received the most cruel treatment by the miners, killing their males, taking their wives and daughters setting fires to their homes, destroying their villages, taking their land for mining claims and leaving no records or history to tell the story, but the scars are still there. And what I like to also mention to people is when we talk about the scars, we're not just talking about the scars of us, we're actually talking about the scars on the land. I mean, the land itself was attacked. It was treated very badly. It, and, and, and some of the things we have not been able to like get like fix, like it's a, it's a, temp, it's a permanent scar of the gold rush that they would blow up whole mountains or they would slide whole like sides of hills into the river. It, it's something that we can't actually go and change back. So we have to look at it and be like, that happened during the gold rush. They poured mercury into the water during the gold rush, trying to get um, at like gold flakes that were on the top of the streams that were running through. So they would see a stream and just pour massive amounts of mercury into it. We have not ever been able to fix that problem. Like there are still streams that have too high of a content of mercury because of what happened in the gold rush. They took thousands upon thousands of tons of earth and they would move it from one place to another. So they completely destroyed like the landscape. You're looking at like the fact that like the gold rush is also what um, a lot of people talk about as an eco side, like they're really attacking the land. So when we talk about the scars still being there, it's also the scars on the land. Now, one thing he wrote that I really appreciate and I love about him is he was trying to like leave behind for us, like records for us to understand who we are as Indian people. He actually wrote in one of his writings, I have learned through my life that we were highly civilized, that of which will never be equaled. That's, he's talking about the Karuks, right? And he says, the civilization that is patterned from the materials that kills human lives is poorly civilized. Um, and I love this about him as like an Indian philosopher, because again, like I was saying, helps you to imagine beyond what we think is like the normal way of putting a civilization together. I have so many people coming to me that are like, you all were primitive hunter gatherers. And I was like, well, my great grandfather used to tell me who's primitive. Uh, the person that takes all of their knowledge and decides they're going to find a good way to live with the planet so that everybody has everything that they need, or the society that decides it's going to take all of its knowledge and make weapons that kill people. Like who's primitive? Um, and he was really clear of us understanding that it was our culture, our histories, our stories that had the information that we needed to build the best society, that we were there, we were having these really philosophical conversations. He also would tell me a lot about like, I would ask him like, why do you work with scientists and like people who come here as like to do resource management? Like, why do you talk to these people? They, they really have done horrific things like in their own work before. And he would say, Kacha, uh, scientists are like the Western science and Western knowledge is very young. He's like, it's, they're like toddlers. They haven't been here very long. And our knowledge is very old. Like we've been here for thousands upon thousands of years, bare minimum. We say since the beginning of time, like he's like, we have so much knowledge about this place. We have hundreds of millions of experiments that we have run over that period of time to figure out how you live here. We have knowledge that is based on 
thousands of years of observation, experimentation, scientific research. And they're still learning about it. He's like, so you got to help them because they're like little baby toddlers. That's why Western scientists always say, I know, I know when you tell them something. He's like, because they think they know, but they don't know. And you can, you, you, we have to grow them up in this space and they'll figure it out. So he was really clear, like, our knowledge is the way that we can kind of build this forward. Now, when we talk about land return, I will say our knowledge is the way that we're going to get out of these issues with climate change. The only way to move forward with climate resiliency is with indigenous knowledge. That's what they're, they're just, people are just starting to figure that out. And I think we're all like, yeah, we know. Um, and I will say that it's actually been proven through several studies and courses of research that when indigenous peoples are the primary land owners uh, and they have like the, they are the ones managing the territory that it tends to be that those territories have some of the highest levels of biodiversity, protection of forests, protection of natural resources of any other region in the world. So they do worldwide studies that show that if indigenous peoples are the primary landowners, it actually is where you see the spaces being protected and actually being brought up toward what we need them to be for uh, ongoing climate resiliency. So in this case, this is a statistic that people have passed around. Indigenous peoples are 4% of the world's population, live on 22% of the Earth's surface, and on that land is 80% of the planet's remaining biodiversity. So to think about the fact that there is something about Indigenous peoples' sovereignty over lands that actually protects lands for the future. Um, we see here like one of our primary examples of this is how we did cultural burning and the ways in which cultural burning has, uh, is so important to who we are as Native people. If you look at uh, forests that have been managed and have been continuing cultural burning, um, post large forest fires, they actually are much more resilient against some of the things uh, that happen in the community. So you'll look at like a pre-managed forest over here on the left versus when after, this is after a forest fire, it really, you're seeing that there's a, it's a lot more resilient because of the cultural burning. An unmanaged forest, one that's like, oh, we left it alone, we don't do anything with it, um, instead results in really bad like levels of what happens to the trees, the like level of fire that's being burned. And so I think it's important to think about like our cultural management is what helps to make sure that when things happen, like based on lots of knowledge, that we are able to protect like the region in a way that makes sense for all the beings that live there. Which brings me here. So Tuluwa is, the, um, is a sacred island in our region. It actually is located uh, very near Jarutjiji or what is currently called Eureka, California, but in, in Wiat it's Jarutjiji. Um, I live in Gudini, which is uh, currently called Arcata, California, which is where Humboldt State University is. And when you drive over the bridge <clears throat> from Arcata, California to uh, Jarutjiji, what you see when you drive straight over it is Tuluwat. Um, colloquially, it is referred to as Indian Island in, the, in much of the history books, people will call it Indian Island. Um, but its actual name is Tuluwat. That's the name, that's the place of world renewal and the center for spiritual life for Wiat people. It's a place where they say the world came into being. It's one of the places that balance this world. They have a very, very old, old relationship with this place. Um, and Tuluat is a sacred place to them. It's like a sacred island. Uh, on February 26, 1860, they did the, what they call the Indian Island Massacre. It's a famous event in California history. Um, where uh, a five-day killing spree ensued by Humboldt County citizens who came in the middle of the night while the Wiat were in world renewal ceremony. So the Wiat were in ceremony, which meant that primarily their men were sleeping in another place while their women, children, and elders were sleeping on the island. Uh, in the midst of that world renewal ceremony, in the middle of the night, a group of Humboldt County citizens showed up primarily with what Tony Platt, he's a historian, he calls quiet weapons, hatchets and knives and proceeded to kill as many people as they could on the island. Um, I remind people that like killing with hatchets and knives is its own thing because at that point you can hear people screaming or begging for their lives or like running away into the water trying to swim away. Um, it was a horrific, horrific scene. Uh, and we still don't know everybody that participated in, in this region. There's not like a published list of like, we know these people. Nobody was arrested, nobody was fined, nobody was given any sort of punishment. Um, and several like hundred people were killed on the, at this one massacre. And then the rest of the Wiat fled and they had to flee, right? Because people are coming after them, especially during ceremony. So you see them flee the region 
of Eureka. And again, because they flee, suddenly Eureka says, see, now we own all this land. It's ours because you, you guys ran away. So uh, Indian Island then becomes Gunther's Island because Mr. Gunther was like, I live here now. And people are like, oh, that's Gunther's Island. Um, Gunther proceeds to do things like build a boat ramp, start like a bunch of businesses, build some big houses. There used to be a really big house on the island. Uh, and they proceed to take the island and actually destroy it. Um, there's a number of really horrific uh, environmental destructive things that happened on that island. So that by the time the Wiat people were talking about getting it back, they were having, they were looking at a full restoration project of an island that had been completely destroyed uh, based on when people had lived there. Um, now what had happened is that the Wiat tribal leader, her name is Dr. Cheryl Seidner, she actually one day, she was like talking to people and she said, this was 25 years ago, she goes, hey, I'm gonna get that island back. Like we should go get, we should just, we'll get Tuluat back. That's what we're gonna do. And people told her as she said it out loud, that's impossible. Why would any, what? And she's like, oh, no, no, I'm gonna get my island back. Like, just watch. Um, after that, a portion of the island came up for sale uh, and she started to do bake sales and t-shirt sales, anything she could to get money to be able to buy a very small portion of Tuluat. Um, because of that, people started to go like, what are you trying to do? And she's like, well, I, I wanna get my island back. And then people were like, I'll donate to get your island back. And she raised enough money so that we ought to buy a very small, portion. Now, after that, they started having conversations with the city of Eureka because the city of Eureka owned a much larger portion of Tuluat. They called it surplus land. And the reason why it was surplus land is that you couldn't build anything there because of the status of how the land was. And two, the city of Eureka never is planned on having enough money that they could actually fix all the issues that you would need to fix in order to do things on the island. So they weren't willing to really like, they couldn't really invest in the environmental cleanup. So they start having conversations with the city of Eureka about the return of Tuluat to the Wiat tribe. And the Wiat tribe in, in taking on this plan was saying, we will restore it. We'll work on the restoration. We'll work on what needs to happen. We'll, we'll make sure we get the funding. We need the island back. We need to restore our center of world renewal. So in 2004, the Eureka City Council approved a resolution to return one part, the northeastern tip of the island to the Wiat tribe. And it wasn't until 2014, so this was approximately 150 years post the massacre that happened to them, that we out returned to that island and did their first world renewal ceremony that they had done in 150 years. So you're looking at the fact that I always tell people, one, I don't like to tell the story of Tuluat as a story of massacre. A lot of people would start and end with like, there was a big massacre there. I like to tell it as a story of world renewal. And like what our people have been able to do by reconnecting to this place. Now in 2019, the city of Eureka returned the rest of the island except for two portions that are owned privately. So you'll see on this map, you have the private land ownership that's on the island. In 2004, they returned the one tip of 40 acres. In 2019, they returned 202 acres of the island to the Wiat tribe. Uh, so you're seeing that like pr uh, as primary owners now of this space, the Wiat tribe are able to do a couple of really important things. The restoration plan and project, the reconnection to their cultural place, but also the rebalancing of the entire freaking world. Because that's where you go to rebalance the world. Like, and they're like, hey, we're preparing for the rest of the world. We're taking the rest of the world forward. So I think that this is where I always say to people, this is what land return is. This is what it looks like. And I tell people a lot of things, but the first thing I will say is I was there the day that they returned the land to the Wiat people. Um, they asked me to do a speech to talk about like, what, what, do we, what does this mean and what happens next? And then at the end I was like, well, next we take down all the dams, then we give all the rest of the land back. And then we like, like this is what it's gonna look like. Um, but I will say, uh, I do a lot of work on land return and decolonization. I go into spaces and I'm like, you got to give the land back. And then people are like, um, but I will say like being in that room was really important because one, it, it makes it obvious to me that this is possible. And when Cheryl Seidner went in her first speech where she was like, I'm going to get back to the lot. And people said, that's impossible. Uh, fast forward 25 years later and they were getting to the lot back. And I say, I say to people like, I have seen impossible things happen in my lifetime. So we don't need to think that things are impossible. Um, the second thing I'll say is 
the day that it happened, I think people really expected like, what's gonna, what would this even look like? Because when we tell people land return, they go, what does that even look like? Um, and now I can say, oh, it looks like this. And then I can just play this short video that I have of them returning the island to the Wiyot people. That's what it looks like. And there's two things I love about that. One, um, it happened on like a Tuesday uh, and then it was a really beautiful ceremony. And then the next day was Wednesday. Like the whole world didn't fall apart. That wasn't like, people weren't suddenly like, ah, oh, I can't go, right? Like, and so I was like, it was actually just a really nice day. And then the next day was also a really nice day. Like, and so it's not something that's super scary. And in fact, what I'll say is, uh, it was probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced in my whole life. Um, and one thing I will tell people about land return and decolonization is that at first it might feel or sound scary to people. It was the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen in my life. And it was so heartfelt in that room. There were hundreds of people in this room and all of us were just happy. When's the last time you had 150 to 300 people in a room and everybody was just happy? They were just laughing and crying and full, so full of joy. And I was like, that's what I don't want people to lose about decolonization. It, it's hard work, it's exhausting. It's like constant learning about these things. It's pushing yourself in ways you might have never thought. It's getting uncomfortable with what it means to own land under a settler colonial system where indigenous peoples don't, right? It's also really beautiful. It's also really, really, really beautiful. And so I'm gonna show you a portion of this video from the return of Tuluat so that you can see it. Um, because I just wanna remind people like there's, there's also a lot of joy in decolonization. Uh, and we can forget that when we spend a lot of time talking about the fear or the sadness or like what happened or even I don't know if I can make that work or this is scary because it's challenging me to think about my positionality. We can think about that, but in the end, I will tell you, it's the most joy I've ever experienced in a room full of so many different people, just, just happy for what they were able to do. Um, so I'm gonna play you a little bit of the video from that day so you can kind of see it. We've come to be here with the city of Chori Chichi. And I just wanted you to know that um, it wasn't always Eureka. It was Chori Chichi. This is the place where we're from. Tuluat is our island where we would come every year to pray, to sing, to do ceremony. Native people were always making plans for our future, for our next generations. And we never gave up on our land or where we came from. And that's the story I want people to know because I know that the story of Tuluat, which people often refer to as Indian Island, is one of a massacre for most people. But for me, it has always been a place of world renewal and had never really been just about what had happened there, but what was going to happen and what people knew one day would come back. This is not only a historic moment, I believe that it is a transitional one. It's one that moves us in a different direction from the past. And that direction is hopefully one of healing, reconciliation, and greater love for one another and care for one another. This is something that is so important in our communities. Collaboration is not something we see at a large level at the moment, and it's something that needs to happen. We need to come together. We need to work together. We are far better together than we are alone, and we are so thankful that we get a chance to work with this tribe some of them right behind me. 
I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of this and that this council has been in really intentional about pushing this forward and continuing to make this happen. To our WIAT friends, we return to Lawat land to you today without hesitation and without conditions posed by the city. It is being done with the sincerest respect for you, recognizing your reverence for your sacred land and the endurance you have shown as you await its return. For a thousand years, this land was a place of celebration for you, and about 160 years ago, that changed. Your land was not only desecrated in the cultural sense, but in the environmental sense as well. As a country, country we often talk about learning from the past, but sometimes that's not enough. Healing doesn't come from simply knowing better than to make the same mistakes. Returning to Loat land does not erase the pain that your people have suffered. It is a milestone in a complicated relationship with people who live in this region. This is simply a moment in time representing a long, long history of your people. It is a moment that is both solemn as well as celebratory. We hope this is a moment that moves us into the future, forging strong bonds and building a healthier community for everyone. This is your day, and I am humbled to be here to share it with you. Thank you. This is a unanimous yes vote. Motion carries. Welcome home. So I'm here today and, and truly honored to be here representing uh, Congressman Jared Huffman. Uh, the congressman's in Washington, D.C. today. Um, deeply regrets that he can't be here. But he sends his regards to the Wiat tribe and the city of Eureka on this memorable day. Uh, the Wiat tribe uh, suffered greatly during the expansion of settler colonialism in this region, uh, especially here on Tulawat. Uh, the realities of this history are still with us today. For many decades, the tribe has fought for acknowledgement of its loss on Tulawat. But in the early 2000s, faced with that dark history, the city of Eureka decided to confront this history instead of ignore it. That has brought us here today as the city returns Tulawat to the Wiat tribe as part of the amends that should be made. This celebration has truly historic implications. It is an amazing moment that shows how communities can heal. And for me personally, this makes me proud to be a Eurekan. Uh, Congressman Huffman has submitted remarks into the congressional record uh, memorializing this day. And I'll read uh, just the, the last bit of it as I present uh, this to the tribe and the city. Um, Madam Speaker, the repatriation of Tulawat from the city of Eureka to the Wiat tribe has profound importance to the Wiat people, whose ancestors suffered greatly during the early white settlement of the region. I urge my colleagues to join me in recognizing this historic agreement that continues to try to heal the harms of the past. Thank you very much. This has been an intergenerational movement to heal the island, to heal our people, to heal our community. Today we make history together we change their story. Today is a day of pride for the city of Eureka. Today is Tulawat, the return of the Wea people. Today, the Wea people who have lived in this area since the time immemorial, the return to the center of the Wea world. And we do this together as a people of Eureka. So thank you again for being here for this historical event. But before I go, we, did, we forgot one important thing. And we forgot to bring ourselves home. So I'd like to ask Cheryl Seidner to come up again and sing our coming home song. And everybody's welcome to join because we all are coming home. This is our home. This is the we at home as well as your home. Nahi, nahi, no. Nahi, nahi, no, 
Nahi nahi no hua, e no hua, e no hua. Nahi nahi no hua, nahi nahi no hua, nahi nahi no hua, e no hua, e no hua. What is pretty amazing is that we are surrounded by strong people behind us and in front of us. Today is a very historical event, and I want to thank everybody again for being here to join this with us, especially the children. Today is something that you witnessed in history. Today is your day to move forward with our traditions and our cultures. We don't stop here, we move forward. And the next part is the healing of our rivers to bring back our rivers. Without further ado, I think we've been waiting too long. I think it's time to sign. So I will say to end that like there's a lot on YouTube right now about the Wiat Island return if you want to learn more about it if you want to see more about it. Um, including sort of some of the things that they're doing right now and the ways that which they're trying to continue to develop like what their tribe is doing in the region. They recently just got a new building in Eureka, California. So they're gonna have a cultural center and place like there. And um, I feel like the Wiat are one of my really clear examples of what this work really means because you're talking about a people that they truly try to completely genocide. And then you're looking at the ways in which they're coming back from that. And then how they're really able to work toward land return because they are people with a very, very small portion of land in comparison to what they should have. Um, and I will say I'm working at Humboldt State right now on the potential return of a large tract of forest that was donated to Humboldt State University. Uh, and my first question became, why don't we just give that back to the WIAT? Um, especially considering that the WIAT don't own any forest land at this point. Uh, they have actual no forest land in their tribal possession. So it's sort of something to think about in terms of like the work that we do. Uh, my question is always, how do I give it back? Um, and then my second question is like, if we can't, if we're not giving it back, then what are we doing instead? Like, what's the next logical step? I will say, I always say to people, cause they think like giving it back is the last step where they're like, oh no, first we're gonna like make a relationship and then we're gonna do good programs. And then we're gonna live here for a while. And then maybe 50 years from now, we'll work on giving it back. That's like the last step. I actually think land return is the first step. Uh, give it back and then you develop a better relationship, a better way of moving forward, a better program because you're actually starting with the most important step. Uh, nothing is decolonization until land is returned. So um, I'm going to end there. I'm here for questions if people have questions and I have, I think, moderators that are going to help me run it. Yes, you do have moderators and I just want to say thank you and take a moment all together for what we've just heard from you, Dr. Risley and Baldy. And yeah, so I'm gonna really do that. Let it sink in.
So we have questions. We're going to take almost five minutes, not quite five minutes right now for questions, which is going to give us maybe time for one. Um, and then Dr. Rizling Baldi, I'll ask you, how would you like for people who have more questions? Um, it might be great form your own study groups and figure those out because I have a lot going on as a professor or it might be yes email me I'm the expert and indigenous so um, you can let us know about that so I will um, I'll start with three questions that were in the chat and if you would pick one of them Dr. Risling Baldi so Jonathan and Lauren asked I'd like to know more about the gold rush causing genocide and I saw other participants offering book recommendations. I no. Katrina asked about a land back, asking Bill Gates to give his land back and that she would be interested in asking you to lead that Katja. And I also know there are lots of us on this call who can lead movements. And the third from Barbara is I'd like to know more about how we as allies might participate in the land back process. So Dr. Risling Baldi, I'm wondering if you would choose one of those and um, give us your thoughts. Thank you again for your talk. Um, I will say, well, I can answer very shortly, like, sure, I'll ask Bill Gates for all his land back. I don't, I don't care. Um, probably give him a lot to think about, maybe. I don't know. I don't know that guy very well. Uh, but I will say, like, why not? We should, why not? Again, like I said, Cheryl Seidner just started with I'll just get that back someday. Thanks so much. Um, and she and that coming home song, that's like a song they sing traditionally to, to talk about like returning, like coming home and how we bring people home. But yeah. she would sing it all the time to be like, this is the song that I sing to remind myself that someday we're going to return to Tulawat and it will be ours again. And so just singing that over and over again, I feel like we can't say it too much, right? Um, and I think there will come a point where I, I think everybody will just sort of be like, uh oh, she's going to ask the question about land return again. But I'm hoping there will come a point where I'm not the only one that's asking that question. It's like everybody asked that question, right? Um, the second thing I'll say, there's actually there's a lot of resources to kind of pull from regarding learning more about the California gold rush and what it meant for indigenous peoples. Lots of California Indian peoples are creating a number of resources to be able to engage in that. Um, I would highly recommend reading Willie Bauer's work. That's Dr. William Bauer. Um, and he is from Round Valley. He's written a number of books, one including California Indian history through California through native eyes. And then a new one that just actually came out ca called We Are the Land, We Are the People. Um, and it's about California history as well. I primarily try to pull resources only from California Indian peoples. I think at this point, we don't need non-native peoples telling stories about us anymore. We actually have a lot of California Indian peoples that do that work. So I get really excited about how can we have California Indian peoples be the peoples that are the people that we tell people to read, engage with, watch, right? Because in my mind, we, we are the ones that have carried these stories through generations. So as much as you can support the work that we're doing, I will say Heyday is actually um, a publisher that has a, a series of California Indian focused books written by California Indian peoples. Um, and so I think that it's that's another good place to start. Uh, you can always read my book. There's a chapter in there about the California gold Indian history and the gold rush that's primarily focused on like gender and women and the way it affected like gender and women. Um, Jack Norton's book on the genocide in Northwest California Currently, I think out of print, but you can find it in various places. If you come up here and you go to Tin Can Mailman, the used bookstore, they got a bunch of copies of Jack Norton's book, Genocide in Northwest California. Uh, that's one of the best OG original books written about the California Indian genocide from a California Indian person who did the work to document the archives of like what happened. Um, and then I think that people are creating really good resources for online. If you've never looked into the Tending the Wild series or the Tending Nature series through KCET, uh, there's a number of times where they actually introduce the genocide through like historical overview. So you can learn from that perspective and point. And then I will also say um, they have a series called Art Bound and they did, a, they did an episode on basketry, California basketry that really talks about genocide and then like what happened through basketry. So. Um, and then if you're interested in land return, they, uh, if you go to my website, um, which is cutcherrizzlingbaldi.com, and then you go to, there's a section called publications. At the top, there's one called reports. 
Um, I actually, there's a PDF copy in there. You can read a report about land return in California. Uh, you can see all the different ways that it has happened in California. It's not just Tulawat. There has been examples of land return throughout California. There's been examples of land return throughout um, the United States of America. So it's actually a report to help you get context for like land return and what that could be. I always tell people, start by giving people that report and then see how you want us to come talk to you about land return. The collective can help you with that. I have a number of foundations that can help with that. We're hoping to someday hold a really big symposium about land return just for California. Um, if you want to support that, we would love support for that in terms of we need monetary support to put it all together. Uh, we need people that are like, yes, we would be willing to help with like admin support or websites or whatever that looks like. Um, so there's a number of resources there. The last thing I'll say is uh, my students are currently working on an actual um, project right now and we're raising money for it. And so uh, if you, I'll, I don't know who I'm who I'll put it into, but I can put it into Joanna and then if she wants to share it, she can. This is actually a link to our current campaign. Our students started with working with tribal nations to figure out well, what does Humboldt State need to do? Like we're on the unceded territory of Wiat people. Like we need to do something that is actually gonna make a difference in this region. They developed the food sovereignty lab with tribal nations. Uh, and so we actually applied for a space and we're looking to remodel the space and we're gonna develop what is like the leading uh, I mean, really there's none in the nation, but we're gonna develop the leading food sovereignty lab and cultural workshop space that does research and implementation of food sovereignty projects with California Indian peoples to really say like, how do we start to think about this? And land reconnection is one big part of that, especially around gathering basketry materials, uh, traditional land management and knowledges. And so we're trying to raise the funds to remodel it first, and then we will start with all of the projects. Our remodeling will start in this fall and then end next spring, and then we'll have a grand opening, and then suddenly you will see a number of the projects that are coming out of our region. So if people are interested in supporting that, um, I think that's a really good way to step forward and be like, I do want to do something. Like today I got all inspired, I want to do something, and I'm not a notary yet. Um, so donate, you know, like donate and help us to do the work that, that we're doing, and then think about how you can bring Indigenous peoples to the forefront of what you're doing in your own spaces, not as stakeholders, not as informants, not at, but at the forefront as like at the actual forefront of everything you do becomes that because if you're on the land, then that's the responsibility that you have. Wonderful. I'm going to wrap up our time here on the keynote and um, say that it's we're going to take a 10 minute break. So bio break, take a break um, and return at 1142. And that's a little bit later than our um, schedule. And I just if people want to put in the chat their appreciations of Dr. Risling Baldy, or I'm, I imagine there's a way to contact you on your email on your website or through your Humboldt State email um, and again to to take our inspiration into action to take it into more discussion this afternoon about what supporting folks are going to what people who are here listening to keynote speakers are going to take on and do as the work the action the communication so thank you again dr risling baldy that was a really beautiful talk of scholarship action and calling it forward. And we're gonna take a break and reconvene at 1142. Thank you so much.